I can completely get the frustration and the and, and I'm not saying that that's right, that it's right to just get so frustrated that you don't want to talk about it anymore. Mm-hmm. But I completely understand where they're coming from as well. I get why it can get to a point where they're like, why do we have to discuss the fact that we exist? We've been doing this for years and years and years. This is Here's How, Ireland's political, social and current affairs podcast presented by William Campbell. Thank you for downloading episode 146 for the 11th of November 2022. Aoife Gallagher is a research analyst with the Institute for Strategic Dialogue, a counter-extremism think tank, and she's also the author of the book Web of Lies, which was published by Gill Books on the 6th of October. And we had her on the podcast last month talking about all of the tension and issues around trans rights. And we barely scratched the surface of all of the things that I wanted to talk about. So she very kindly agreed to come back on the podcast again to pick up the baton and continue the discussion. She did have limited time to talk to me, but we tried to make the most of it. And after the interview, Kevin and I have a bit of a back and forth between ourselves on the topics covered and some extra ones. Here's How is Ireland's political, social and current affairs podcast. And Aoife, we were talking the last time about how this is being weaponised by people on the right. Aside from the media, there's been essentially laws put into place that I, I think aren't intended to have any legal effect. They have more, more of a, I don't know, a divisive, a wedge effect. This is particularly the case in the US. Can you tell me, you know, as you see, what are the most egregious of those? Mm. Yeah, I mean, I know you say they might they mightn't mean to have a legal effect, but they they certainly do in a lot of ways. Mm-hmm. Um, now I don't have the number off the top of my head because there there have been dozens. I know, like maybe back in March or April, there were over two hundred bills that were you know attempted to be passed through different legislative offices in in the U.S. across mm-hmm. different states. Um, that specifically... so this would be in in of the various House and Senates. Each state has has essentially exactly. two houses. Yeah. yeah. Yes, exactly. So you might be able to get an updated number now. I'm, I'm not very sure, but I know that mm-hmm. it was over over 200 at that point earlier in the year. And um, what, what do they primarily consist of? Yeah, a lot of them kind of prohibit trans people, you know, what we mentioned, you know, previously trans people in sports and uh, prohibit um, trans youths. Uh, most of these bills, it is worth mentioning, are, you know, primarily affect children. Use. Mm-hmm. They're, they're, it's not really about adults. Mm-hmm. Um, others deny gender affirming care. They just, you know, essentially limit it at a state level. Um, others will try to stop people from being able to legally change their gender. So be able to legally change it on their, you know, their documents and things like that. Um, so there's a couple, I suppose, that are worth like really mentioning. The, the There was one, it's not protect, or specifically an anti-trans bill, but um, it's more of a, a kind of more widespread anti-LGBTQ bill that was... Um, passed in Florida earlier in the year. Uh-huh. It was deemed the, the don't say gay bill. So a lot of people might know it as that because that was kind of how it was kind of being spun, I suppose, by by uh, Democrats. Um, mm-hmm. But it was really called the Parental Rights and Education Bill. That was uh-huh. the, the, it. Was, the it was targeting schools and essentially the Democrats were calling it the don't say gay bill because it essentially forbade teachers from discussing anything to do yes. with LGBT issues. Yes, exactly. So it essentially limits the teaching or even the mentioning of LGBTQ issues in schools. Yeah. So, um, so if, and, if, a, if a kid came, came along and said, I'm being bullied and all the other kids are calling me gay, that really put the teachers in, in a bind because they couldn't, uh, they basically couldn't discuss that with the child. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, and it also included very, you know, fluffy language, I suppose, around how, because I mean, the the, the Republicans were saying that it wasn't going to limit it, that it was only just going to be, you know, limited to age appropriate conversations. And, you know, even the term age appropriate, you know, that can be it's a very subjective term. You know what I mean? It depends on what people uh, want to take out of it. A, a, um, a jury in Tallahassee might come up with a very unusual uh, interpretations exactly. of that. Yes, okay. exactly. Um, one qu- one I question I, I want to... Uh, yeah, go ahead, sorry. mention about that as well is that it also would limit the, you know, LGBTQ teachers in schools would not be able to discuss their, their spouses, right? LGBT, the, the children of LGBTQ parents would not be able to discuss their parents. You know what I mean? So it yeah. really it really limited things like that. And one other one, if you just want, if I, I'd love to mention this one Please as well do. because I just think this one. Um, so in Texas earlier in the year, they... Uh, deemed gender affirming care as child abuse and mm-hmm. started investigating parents who had 
sought care for their for their kids who had sought care for for trans kids so i mean that again it's a very extreme example but it was it was having an impact there there were you know parents being investigated for child abuse and you know that that really shows the the, the extremes really um and again i think it's worth mentioning that um I think now I'm, I'm, I'm not 100% sure with this stat, but I'm pretty sure that over 50% of trans and non-binary children in the US have attempted suicide. Mm-hmm. I'm pretty sure that's um, one of the more updated stats. So it's worth it's worth saying that when we're talking about these kinds of, you know, um, legal attempts, I suppose, as well, to, to, to try yes. and limit the and, and it's it's worth noting also that there's a real effort to find problems where problems don't exist. For example, making very, very stringent laws with very severe penalties for, mm. for example, someone who is perhaps born male, perhaps trans, presents as a woman, so forth, and going into female bathrooms. And I would have thought it's not entirely clear that there's a need for a law on this, but even if there was a need for a law on this, you know, you could add a, you know, a simple line to it saying to the annoyance of other users or something you know something like that whereas somebody exactly, who entirely yeah. was socially presenting as female uh, yeah. and would entirely not fit in in male bathrooms you know and, and wouldn't possibly cause any not even a raised eyebrow uh, yeah. and they deliberately leave this thing, out actually William if you let me mention Please it, sorry, do, yeah. one other thing that's just come into my head recently they've actually tried or house republicans so this is at a federal level in the yes. US um, have actually introduced a federal version of the of the Florida don't take a bill or the parental rights and education bill. Mm-hmm. Now, at the moment, the way that the Congress is, um, Split. you know, weighed, I suppose, yeah, or weighted, um, you know, it, it doesn't look like it's going to pass. But of course, the midterms are coming up. And yes. Change, uh, and also, it's worth know. saying, it's worth saying, the purpose of that may not be for the bill to pass. It is to put this issue into society as a wedge issue and try to put, yes. put try to gain political advantage like that. And yeah. as I was talking to you before we started recording, we got a lot of feedback, a lot of very, very positive feedback, a lot of suggestions of questions and so forth when I mentioned that I will be having you back on again. One of the questions that I'm not going to put to you is <laughs> that LGBT people or trans people or trans rights activists or whatever group you want to, to associate with are in some way to blame for the behaviour of right-wing groups in Europe, particularly the Republicans in the US and so forth. Mm. And I think that's, the reason I'm not putting that question is because I think it's completely invalid. Absolutely. And yeah. because it is, you know, without falling too much into Godwin's law, it's saying, was it the Jews' own fault that Hitler started the Holocaust? <laughs> I'm, you know, I'm glad you, you said it because I was going to say it. it, it so, yes, yeah. and probably that's not the best analogy, although it is a valid one. But it essentially, political group X is not responsible for the behaviour of the opposing group, no matter who they are. Um, but one thing I do want to discuss on that, and this is a theme because I've read, been reading a huge amount on this, I wanted to be very well researched. A, there is a very strong theme from trans people and trans rights activists who are not always trans, it must be noted, that, and the, the, the line is typically along the lines of, our lives aren't up for debate. What do you understand that to mean? Um, I suppose, I think, especially trans people have an issue with the fact that, say, a conversation like what we're having now would be deemed the trans debate, because it does essentially imply that their lives are up for debate, that that people can debate how they get to live their lives, right? Mm-hmm. Um, that's, I suppose, uh, my Roll back, roll back. Sometimes that is their lives as it to say their existence, that the debate yeah, threatens exactly. their existence or, the or the, to threatens the way are, they live their lives? Which which do you understand yeah. that to mean or both? Um, well, it'll depend the, the way they live their lives and their existence, I think. I think that, you know, it depends depend on the conversation. It depends on who is having the discussion. Mm-hmm. Um, there are definitely people who would deny the fact that trans people even exist, you know, or, you mm-hmm. know, deny, I suppose, trans people exist in the way that we understand it too and would instead want to call it a mental health issue or or whatever, you know, something like that. Um, so, yeah, I suppose that's my understanding of it really is kind of debating, you know, their basic human rights and their basic rights to exist, I suppose, yeah. Okay, but nevertheless, and I'm using here trans as a short hand for the people who are debating on the trans side of the house who are uh, perhaps yourself or you know people who are not trans but who are sympathetic to that cause and so mm. forth i want to have a shorthand for that but yeah. those people are unquestionably calling for changes in the law changes in society changes in social attitudes and so forth surely you can't have change without discussing what the change would be it's it's a recipe for disaster to say this is the change we want and we want nobody to talk about it um, well, I'd like if you give me an example, I suppose. I think it would be easier to talk about that if there was an example, because, I mean, the way that I look at it is that 
when laws are changed or, you know, legislation is put in place in order to, you know, further, I suppose, the rights of trans people, the only mm. people that it affects is trans people, right? So, No, that, that's not always true. Okay, well, give me, give me an example. Well, well, well f- first, of all, f- first of all, we live, hopefully, in a democracy, in which case changes are made by the will of the whole of the people. But when we had same-sex marriage introduced, that was a referendum that was participated by people on all sides in society. I don't see it, how it could be done any other way. And I did mention to you on the la- last podcast, you, know, you said that the rugby debate with the IRFU affected only two people. And that's not strictly true. It, you know, it, it does affect all of the other people who play rugby as well. People have opinions. And it does seem to me that there is a tendency, and it often goes with that slogan, our lives aren't up for debate, for essentially refusing to participate in any debate, you know, with people who agree, disagree with them, even in the, in the mildest way. And I'm just wondering, is that constructive? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's obviously, I think that there, ne- you know, there needs to be um, discussions about things like this, right? Mm-hmm. And you know, and again, like I, you know, don't really like speaking for trans people because I am not a trans person, but I can completely understand that if you have lived your life as a trans person and gone through all the difficulties that we know that trans people go through. And we're now at this point where, you know, on one on one side of the fence, people are becoming more accepting of things. And on the other side of the fence, people are encroaching on, on you know, as you say, people's, you know, right to exist and their their right to live their lives the way they want. I can completely get the frustration and the and and I'm not saying that that's right, that it's right to just get so frustrated that you don't want to talk about it anymore. Mm -hmm. But I completely understand where they're coming from as well. I get why it can get to a point where they're like, why do we have to discuss the fact that we exist? We've been doing this for years and years and years. No, 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 but I'm not talking in reason in response to questions of whether trans people exist. Obviously, that's well, silly. Yeah, sorry, but in, in yeah. response to, you know, specific debates and specific policy issues, there does seem to be a fairly large cohort. And I say this because I've experienced it and I'm talking to you about this. And with the greatest of respect, Eva, and I'm very glad to have you on, but I have gone through both the official, that's to say, you know, organizations and so forth, and other prominent trans people, and over really quite a long number of months, made very extensive efforts to get someone to talk to. And I hope I don't come Mm -hmm. across as a, you know, a shock jock. I think I try to be very analytical and to listen to people's points of view and to present an opposing point of view. And frequently the response was nothing, not respond. And in other cases, it was essentially a request for a guarantee that no opposing point of view Mm. would be put by either me or anyone else. And I'm not sure that's something, and I can absolutely understand why people want it, but I think, you know, pretty much every group campaigning for change would like their campaign not to be challenged. Yeah, yeah, you know, absolutely. And yeah, I mean, I suppose I kind of, I find it kind of difficult to answer that question. I think because okay. I'm because I'm not trans. Do you know what I mean? And I do. A, a, I, I, and like, I, and do I have to say, and I have to say, thank you for it. Also, because you have the gumption to come and uh, debate the issue. And yeah. uh, um, uh, so <laughs> I, 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 I'm, I want very much not to paint you with that with that particular brush. But one of the things in the original article in the journal that I read and that prompted me to get in touch with you was you used the phrase assigned male or assigned female at birth. And this is sometimes mm-hmm. made put into an acronym AFAB or AFAB or AMAB. That sort of language and also the use of a word cis, which I might get you to define, define in a moment, is very much framing the language in a way that people on a particular side of the debate wish to frame it. And language very often frames our ideas as well. And we know that in different political debates, people have tried very hard to control language, not least, um, uh, for example, the unionists at one point sought to use exclusively the phrase Sinn Féin IRA in order to try to promote the image of them being the same organisation. Mm. But, but that, I have a problem with both of those. And just to deal with the assigned male or assigned female at birth, that's just specifically incorrect because nobody is assigned any any sex or gender at birth. That's inherent to them. And now, you know, you're assigned a name at birth. That's a human process. Humans decide something which is part of human culture. You're not assigned an eye colour or male or female at birth. And that does seem to me to, as well as being incorrect, be unhelpful because people know that that's not true, don't they? Well, I don't know if I understand what you're saying, that it's not true. I mean, when people are born, 
they are they have some they have they some are, inherent they're... qualities and they have some qualities which are attributed to them by society so an inherent quality might be their eye color and a uh, quality attributed to them by society might be the name that their parents or whoever give them and clearly their sex whether they're male or female falls into the first of those two categories um Yes. Okay. Right. So, so, so they're not assigned left. anything. That as, that word assigned, I think, is, per, okay, is yeah, chosen yeah. particularly to give the impression that that's something that's arbitrarily chosen by people. Yeah. I mean, now I will say that. Okay, I'll make two points about this. Right. I think that because you know, in in general, in the discussions about trans and, and non-binary and kind of you know gender identity in general, I think there is a need for for new language because of the fact that we have kind of been brought up in this binary world. Do you know what I mean, male and female, and 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 things like that, right? So there is a need for new language. I obviously do not. But it should be based have, in have truth. Part. Well, yeah, exactly, right. But and now I'll go on to the the point about you know being assigned male or female at birth. I am not sure. Now I'm not sure if you, you might know the the answer to this. I'm not sure if um. What people are referring to there is, again, this goes back to the difference between sex and gender, right? So are people, if it is the case that this is meant to refer to gender, then I would say that assigned female at birth or assigned male at birth is accurate if you understand. And again, I'm not going into this again because I know we talked about this yeah, in, yeah. in the but, last But I, I thought male and female did not refer to gender. Well, male and f- well. You see um, that the slippiness with the language, and I don't want to crucify you over this, mm. but but I just want to point out in your own article that you wrote in the, in, on the journal, and we discussed the figure, and I think you, you, you kind of resolved from the figure, but you said that approximately 1.7% of the world's population are born mm. intersex. Yeah. So somebody's not born male, they're not born female, but if they're intersex, they're born intersex. And mm. what I'm going to suggest to you is that there is perhaps in... You and many other people who have, I have no doubt, nothing but good in their heart, an anxiety to be correct and not to be offensive. And that that anxiety can sometimes get overextended to the degree that it almost becomes inaccessible to truth. And that, although it's coming from a good place, is not mm. a good thing. Yeah, I mean, I don't, again, I don't know if I agree with you completely. I kind of get where you're coming from. I do get where you're coming from, but I don't know if I completely agree with you. And as I say, I do think that there is a need for new kind of language. Now, whether that specific term assigned, you know, and the use mm-hmm. of that specific word i mean i would lo- I'll, I'll happily look into this, to be honest, and see mm-hmm. and see where it came from and see, I'm, I'm sure it's a, I'm, guessing does again this is the guess i'm sure it might be a medical term and might i'm 100 percent sure from. it's not it's not okay no, well i mean not. yeah okay yeah as i say but it, like i would i mean that the, you've kind of sparked my interest now to be honest with you but okay. it is actually something that i would like to to look into and kind of see where it came from that's and see enough. where the actual yeah that, 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 that's fair enough but actually that's not the and, and that is interesting but it's not the part i'm most interested in i'm more interested in the issue of anxiety of people to be not offensive and also to be seen to be correct and to be seen to be doing, you know, what is the right thing, particularly within their own in-group, that that can sometimes cause them to make an error or even cause them long-term moral blindness. Yeah, I mean, people have biases, right? And I'm mm-hmm. not going to say that I'm not biased. I mean, as I said to you the last time, I'm, I'm a gay woman and I definitely have biases when it comes to um, trying sure. to get people to accept the, the lives of queer people. Um, so, of course, people have biases. And, you know, again, I don't, I don't, I don't, as I say, okay. I don't know if I agree with what you're saying. I don't know if, like, but I, but I will say that, of course, everyone that's, that I do, that I do think that people that are talking about this in general, of course, there, there is a need to kind of use language in a way that isn't deemed um i suppose hateful against the people that you're trying to protect you know yeah, what I mean? but, but but to go back to that thing of uh, trans uh, rights activists being very reluctant to participate in in robust debates this anxiety not to create hurt could be then weaponized to shut down very necessary debates and the one that i'm thinking of is and i've studied this uh, quite carefully and, and it's difficult to get the absolute exact figures for moments for reasons why I'll give in a moment. But the concentration of apparently trans people in the prison system, and I'm, the figures I'm getting are from, from the UK, is so extreme as to be 
incredible. We agreed, and we looked at the figures last time, there's about something under one in 5,000 people appear to be trans, uh, according to Irish figures, and there's no particular reason to think that Ireland is particularly different to the UK. The figure looks like something, something like one in 50 amongst prisoners in the mm. UK. So that's a hundred times greater. And and this is a more problematic, and I'll explain why I haven't been able to get the absolute figure, but it is even higher, much higher amongst amongst people in prison for sex offences or people. And the asterisk beside that is it's not entirely clear whether the person who is A, a sex offender and B, in prison is in prison at that time because they're a sex offender and the statistics are not of the highest quality on that. Mm. But even taking that into account, the number of prisoners, in particular prisoners in prison who have a record as sex offenders, and this is overwhelmingly people born male and who are now presenting as or claiming to be female, it is so extraordinarily different to those figures that appear in society. And what that is being weaponized by people on the right and saying, ha, look, all these trans people are just paedophiles. And I don't mm. think that that's happening. The, the other potential explanation is that some sex offenders are gaming the system, mm. getting themselves taken out of male prisons, which are typically much, much tougher in the UK than female prisons, and also gaining a whole host of other advantages. And as you will know, there is a live debate as to who can call themselves trans and what can, you know, how that can be triggered and uh, what's called self-ID. That's to say just somebody just pitches up and say, I'm trans, and then they've ticked that box and that, then that is accepted. Mm. I would have thought that people who have the, truly have the interest of trans people at heart would want to put some gatekeeping on that and say, hang on a second, any, and unfortunately that's what it is, anyone who's locked up for child abuse who just says, I'm trans, shouldn't be immediately given all of the consideration that, that flows from that. Mm. Yeah, I mean, I'll be honest with you, I haven't looked into that subject in particular, mm. right? So... Again, I, okay. I don't like talking about things that I but but I will say that because yeah. I was wondering where you were going with it. And I, like in my head, I was kind of like, I wonder, you know, I was kind of like, I wonder why that is. And you were saying that, you know, people game in the system. Yeah. Like, I mean, I don't think there should be there shouldn't be a, you know, a debate about that side of it at all. There should not be attempts to game the system in that in that way. Do you know what I mean? That's same. True, not, but really there are just, evil people out there. And, of they, course, and, yeah. and they will try, you know, if they perceive something, particularly they perceive something that is socially difficult to criticize they're going to do it mm, yeah yeah exactly yeah i mean that to me is just um i mean it, it you know as i say it's hard to, to to figure out what to say about it but i do think that it's i mean i suppose what i will say about it is that it's unfortunate that people gaming the system are you know having such an effect on the people that genuinely need to you know avail of Absolutely, you know, yeah, I, I totally, I like totally that. agree. You know I totally I mean? agree. Yeah, I, yeah, I, could, mm -hmm. I couldn't agree with that more. Yeah, um, but it is. I mean, that that is definitely something that I think needs um, needs further digging into. I would say. Okay, and I won't. I will put it in as a comment rather than a question to to you. But if sex offenders are willing to game, you know, to use the trans issue to game the system in prison, it stands to reason that they're likely to game that same system when they are out of prison. Uh, yeah, um, I mean but, that discussion is just so that it's so toxic. I mean, as you said, absolutely, yourself, I mean, yeah, absolutely. When it comes to trying to equate uh, trans people with paedophilia, that's you know, you're getting yes, really absolutely, and and, and and a clever ex and that's that's essentially what I'm getting at. That mm. you know, people who are politically motivated to exploit the issue and make it more toxic, in the absence of pushback and in the absence of a debate, can say. It can, can flip what I think is the true position and say it's not paedophiles claiming to be trans, it's all trans are paedophiles. And I don't accept that, not for one moment. Mm, yeah. um, in that case, and I accept, you know, if it's not an area your expertise on, I'm not going to try and push on that. Mm -hmm. um, but you will be aware of the Tavistock Clinic in the UK. Okay. Many young people in Ireland. So this is a gender identity clinic specifically for minors, specifically for under 18s. There's uh, some debate as to whether you should call everybody under 18 a child or whatever. And that can be perhaps slightly emotive and not always uh, giving the right thing, but specifically for under 18s. That has recently been closed down following an absolutely excoriating report in terms of the quality of care and the, in particular the quality of record keeping and uh, psychological care given to patients. Mm. It is worth noting that in a, over the period of about 10 years, the number of children and teenagers going through the Tavistock Clinic exploded. So mm. from 2009 
10, there was a total of 32 girls and 40 boys referred. In 2020, so in, in 10 years, 2021, so 11 years, that went from 72 to 2,728. So an absolute explosion in the numbers. Mm. And it's actually even more worrying when you look at the breakdown of the numbers, because previously boys had been more than half of the, uh, about, about 55, 60% of the referees of the, the patients. Mm -hmm. And that explosion in the numbers made it that came much more from girls than from boys and was heavily concentrated in the ages of 13, 14, 15 year old girls. Mm -hmm. So so a huge, not all of it, but a huge proportion, by far the largest proportion of that increase came from girls. There is also strong evidence that girls uh, with autism were vastly overrepresented and girls who were lesbians with or had previously presented as lesbians with auth autism were enormously overrepresented. So for example, if you break down the figures, 13 year olds 86% of the referees of the patients mm. aged 13 are girls, 82% aged 14 are girls. So it's an entirely different demographic cohort that they began to treat. Mm -hmm. um, you have been a teenage girl. I guess it might have been a bit different uh, experience if you were a lesbian, but maybe not that much. I'll defer to you on that. But you'll be aware that in that age group, there are significant mental health challenges that are characteristic of that. Very often those are communicable psychological disorders, particularly anorexia and self-harm. Those particularly deal with body image mm. and social media is seen as a particular driver of that. Mm. Just with that information and nothing else, don't you think it's reasonable to ask the question, might this not be what we think it is? Um, I suppose the way I look at it <clears throat> is that, again, I think I probably said this in the, the last time we talked mm -hmm. as well, what, and I get that the, the Tavistock Clinic and everything that came out about that was really not great, you know what I mean? But that what what should be happening here is that there should be more resources and more time put into understanding trans youth, because of course... I think if people are being put forth for treatments like that and it turns out that they are being treated for something that's, they're very, you know, been treated for gender dysphoria when that is not their issue, um, that is extremely problematic. Yeah. Of course it is, right? So yes, I absolutely agree with that. And I absolutely agree that there that this is the reason why there should be more of an effort put into understanding these issues because there needs, you know, I think there's a bit of a, a trend and I think maybe in the UK at the moment with with trying to stop this care at all in the UK um, because of because of what came out about Tavistock and things like that. Yeah, No, and, no, 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 but I, I understand that. That's different and I want to get mm. on to that. But just on that issue that you're seeing that you've got a explosion of referrals at the same time that the issue has exploded on social media, mm. B, that the cohort is completely different to the cohort that you were dealing with previously, and C, the cohort is enormously concentrated amongst a population, young teenage girls, 13, 14, 15 year olds, mm. who are known to be extremely susceptible to psychological disorders that are, uh, that are socially communicable. Mm. And uh, as we know, this has been uh, on social media, a very, very active topic on social media. To me, that alone would, would say that you need to act with extreme caution. And yeah. the, the one thing that I did was I looked up, you know, what, what was the, essentially the treatment. And one of the treatments being given was an off-label use of what are called puberty inhibitors or puberty blockers, which essentially mm. stop people, the, the physical changes in your body that normally happen at puberty. Mm. These drugs were originally developed for what's called precocious pu puberty, where it's quite a rare, but it happens disorder that children as young as three, four, five can begin puberty. That's quite damaging. Their body will be damaged if that happens because other processes in their body just aren't ready to kick in for puberty. And then that treatment is then typically stopped at 11, 12, and the puberty then proceeds correctly. Mm. What, what overwhelmingly is used as treatment for these many, many hundreds of girls who are being 
referred to this Tav- Tavistock clinic is to give them those puberty blockers all the way up to like so in other words to stop them from having puberty when they should and I'm not a doctor and neither are you so I can't comment on you know that medical issue but in the media and if you search on this issue and search for the the phrase completely reversible or totally reversible then you will find that all over pro-trans social media and even into, I found it on uh, GCN, Gay Community News, which is a very respectable uh, gay publication in Ireland. It's probably the largest uh, gay magazine or newspaper. And they are saying as fact that this is completely reversible. There is no medical evidence to support that whatsoever. That in fact, mm. this is being used off, off-label and there's no evidence at all. That's incredibly irresponsible, isn't it? Absolutely. I mean, that, that's the thing. I feel like there's, you know, there's points like that that you're making very well. <laughs> and, um, Thank you. And there, and there is maybe a lack of wanting to say, yes, that's wrong. Do you yeah. know what I mean? And yeah, I, I, do think I, that's I would have thought, I would have like, thought, yeah. and there's, there's, there's a couple, but, uh, but they tend to be very um, isolated and vilified. One is Blair White, who is a very conservative and Republican supporting trans woman in the US and YouTuber. And she's entertaining sometimes and she's right sometimes and she's to my view wrong sometimes but she has but the number of voices saying that and the number of voices and the reaction to them indicates that almost nobody in the trans or trans rights community is willing to say that and it seems blindingly obvious to me mm. and people who say it are shot down with great force yeah yeah, I mean, look, you're not going to get me disagreeing. With that, That's okay. So, um, That's fair enough. I, yeah, I, I, yeah. I don't want to, to um, um, twist your arm if you accept that, and, and, and I and you know, and I accept what you're saying. Yeah. But like, I, just, I, I'll just reiterate, reiterate mm. again, William, and I know I've said this a few times, yeah, but sure. I just think it's so important. I think that when you when these discussions are had, it really needs to come around to the need for regulation. It comes around to the need to really understand this and to really be able to decide what children need when they are going through those things. And I do think that there's, you know, the kind of frustration and the, I suppose, the the way that a lot of these conversations turn to extremes online very quickly come from the fact that there are a lot of people out there who just want to get rid of trans gender affirming care sure, yeah. altogether. Do you know what I, I mean? And, so, and, a, and, and I think, is it possible then that there's an unthinking reaction from people who are horrified by that and they defend everything that mm-hmm. has the trans label on it and anything and everything that can grab the trans label and smother themselves in it. Mm-hmm. And as with prisoners, who I think in some cases at least are, you know, are gaming that system, yeah. there is such a reluctance to, to criticise anything with the trans label. Since you're not an expert on, and, on medical areas and neither am I, I, I want to just look at a Reuters story with a headline which said, at age 10, this transgender model is advocating for other kids. And it says, at just 10 years old, Noelle Maher is believed to be the youngest transgender model ever to walk the runway at New York Fashion Week. And Noelle mm-hmm parents believe it's their job to foster her dreams which includes being an advocate for other trans kids the fact that she uh, has this want to be an activist and be visible to other trans kids we know it's important for her to do this work right now noelle uh, sorry noella expressed to her parents at around the age of two that she was a girl and that they supported this journey mm. um you know, I've been around toddlers who have insisted with great force and over an extended period that they're dinosaurs. And, you know, what I say <laughs> is, that's great. It, the, the, what horrifies me about this is not just the situation, although that's pretty horrific, but that's a single situation. And I don't want to, you know, pull a, a single example. You, you spoke on the last time, you know, about pulling single extreme examples mm. uh, uh, and, and, you know, making them the mascot for the whole thing. What horrifies me about this is Reuters, which is, you know, a very straight up news organization, ran this entire thing as a human interest story. Mm. We, uh, and what was screaming out to me, by the way, that when they say Noella's parents, they're referring to a couple who are two trans men, that's to say two people born as women, lesbians who both transitioned to be male. Mm-hmm. And that's, uh, first of all, I'd be extremely suspicious of any parent who puts a child on a New York Fashion Week stage. <laughs> yeah, to begin that's with. a separate issue. It, 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 yeah. it, that's a separate issue, but it might be connected because it's, as you were aware, there is a medical condition called Munchausen syndrome by proxy, which essentially involves usually a parent uh, causing 
by whatever means ill health in their child in order to gain attention. Mm. This screams that to me. Yeah. This and uh, but however, and psychologists and psychiatrists will tell you it is not ethical to diagnose someone at you know at a distance over the, you know the media through media reports and so forth and even if that was ethical I wouldn't be qualified to do it. But I would say at least raising a question about that, about the validity of a two-year-old born a boy saying that she was a girl and then being raised in that way. And it seems more than a coincidence that both the parents in the house are also uh, identified as trans people. That's mm. horrendous. And I'm only asking you to, con- to comment on the media side of that, that, that that's then just presented as a straight up human interest story. Yeah, I mean, maybe there should have been a little bit more digging going on there and a, you know a few more questions asked um about that story in general and I haven't read it myself and I don't know anything about you know I only know what you told me right so I mean I'm, that's all I'm basing it on to be honest but I will say that kind of on the I know you were saying that you know two-year-olds think they're dinosaurs and things like that and that's very true right but I mean there are I've you know listened to multiple interviews with the parents of of trans kids who will say and this is it's a common thing that's that you know they will say that from the age of three or four, very, very young, that they were, you know, telling their parents that they thought they were a different gender, that they were born in the wrong body. How and does a three so, or four-year-old get that vocabulary? Um, I'm like I'm not I, I'm not 100 percent sure. I don't have kids, so I'm not 100 percent no. sure when um, when kids would start thinking like that. But I'll tell you this, and this is again, this is just from from my own youth, right? Um, I mean, I didn't come out, on, or sorry, I didn't really realize that I was gay until I was about uh, 16 or 17, right? Um. But when I did realize that I was gay and I thought back on my youth, there were so many times when I was young and very young that there were signs there that I was definitely, you know, had some kind of an affinity towards girls and women more than more so than I did towards boys. So there is definitely, you know, the the, the, the fact that, you know, children would know when they're very young about the way they are like sure, that. But, but that I is being expressed that that is, yeah, I, I understand and yeah. that's not that's a, that's a valid point however that is in philosophy I think the uh, name of the fallacy is the survivorship bias it's looking at all gay people and saying oh yeah or, or trans people or whatever and saying oh yeah I knew I didn't fit in this way everybody gay, straight or anything knows that they're different or don't fit in in some way and it's very easy to then just refer that to say oh that was the indication that I was gay that I that I missed mm-hmm. and and for, so for, I mean I, I'm comparing this to uh, you will be aware in Rotherham and some other typically northern English cities mm. there was going over many years an unbelievable scandal where men who were exclusively from Pakistani and uh, Bengali ethnic origin who were Muslims Mm -hmm. were committing most unbelievable child abuse and exploitation of young girls. In the report, typically white girls, it's not clear whether they were also doing that, uh, girls from their own community. That's a scandal and so forth. But the reason that it was not caught, despite having been reported to social workers and police for many years, was because the social workers and the police came from a generation that essentially rebelled against the racism of their parents and they were exceptionally sensitive to being called racist and the fact that the criminals, many of now who are, now are in jail, were uh, Muslim South Asians, basically, in the eyes of these people, gave them a pass. And the documentation, there's been a report, uh, what's called the J Report, which I've also read previously, it just examined the documentation from social works and so forth. And these girls, girls aged 13 and 14, who were constantly being referred to social services, were being referred all the time in their documentation as prostitutes. Jesus. And, I mean, it's just the most horrendous scandal. And this this affected literally hundreds of girls. Mm. Uh, the, the men involved were essentially prostituting the girls in the sense that the men were taking money for allowing like 30 and 40 men a night to rape 13, 14, 15-year-old girls. And this situation endured for years. And my point is that as, you know, humans, we can be guilty of horrendous moral blindness. And, you know, you have, I've put various issues to here and, you know, you've defended some things and and you've kind of agreed with me on others. But my issue isn't that each specific instance of apparent, you know, an apparent mistake being made. My issue is that there is a pattern of really serious wrongdoing that 
is not being challenged because of this group ideology that that says essentially anybody who says trans people are bad must be fascist Nazis and therefore mm. anything that trans people are being criticised for is automatically not wrong or anything with that label regardless of whether it's being done by trans people or not. Yeah, I mean, like, like I agree with you, William. Do you know what I mean? I do agree that there that there needs that there's a lack of nuance in the conversation, and there is a tendency to find your corner and stick to it, and that's it. Do you know uh-huh. what I mean? Um, and I do think that maybe a lot of it kind of revolves around the fact that because anti-trans rhetoric has become an absolute mainstay of fascists and of the far right, that because they use the and actually, I'm going to shamelessly pitch my book because I, I do have to do, go yes. in a minute, William. All right. But um, I, I, so my, my book is about conspiracy theories and kind of how people get drawn into them. And one of the main points that I want to, to make in the book is the fact that, and this is, refers to, to, to anti-trans stuff as well, that conspiracy theories are generally rooted in very, very real grievances and that conspiracy theorists can use these very real grievances in order to pull people into more extreme ends, right? And it's the same with the anti-trans stuff, right? Mm -hmm. It's the same because they can use these very real, you know, stories and different kinds of scenarios and the, you know, the couple that that you've mentioned um, in order to pull people into more extremes. And I think that there is a tendency and it's wrong, you know, you're not, I'm not saying that it's right there, but there is a tendency for people to try and just deny that because they, there's a fear that people will be sucked even more further into that kind of rhetoric. Do you know what I mean? I do. And I know that you have yeah. a time limitation, so I will give you my thesis on that and yeah. allow you to, to comment on it. And my thesis is that there are evil people out there and there will always be evil people out there. And debating that or, you know, discussing that is largely useless. There will always be, you know, people who are coming up on the far right using, you know, to attack whatever minority they can for their own ends. There will also mm-hmm. always be some people who will try to infiltrate groups or to steal the label of groups that they feel will gain them sympathy and to in, in order to disguise their own bad behavior. But in the middle between those two groups, there is the broad mass of humanity. And if we want to be a better society, then the thing to do is that when trans people or any other group that may be put upon are demanding their rights or, you know, proper treatment in society, then to support that to the hilt. But when either they because they're misguided, or other people because they are exploiting the issue, demand something like changes in the law or changes in the language that we have to say things that are that are just objectively untrue, or that we have to put up with treatment of people that is is not acceptable, then the thing to do is, even if that's coming from a good place, to stand up to it and to very vigorously say that that's unacceptable. Mm. And if we don't, that leaves, and that gets me back to my first point, that I don't think you can blame Group X for their, you know, the, the, the behavior of their opposition. But you can blame anyone for the poor quality of the debate if they're not, con- you know, if they're not being honest and being truthful to the issue and saying whether it's with language or whether it's turning a blind eye to malpractice. Yeah. That's my thesis. I, I'm get from your interjections, I'm guessing that you're with me on that. Yeah, I mean, I think I am kind of broadly, yeah, for sure. And I think that, um, you know, I've, I've, I've really enjoyed our chats, to be honest. I think it's really sparked, uh, you know, it sparked quite a, like thinking in me as well. Do you know what I mean? And I think that hopefully for anyone that listens to it as well, it'll it'll inject some nuance into the conversation that, that's very, very much needed. Um, but yeah, unfortunately, William, I have to run. <laughs> Aoife Gallagher, uh, the author of Web of Lies, published by Gill Books on the 6th of October. Thank you very much for talking to me. Thanks so much, William. If you like the Here's How podcast, please rate and review the show on iTunes and other podcast providers. Share it on Facebook and Twitter, but most of all, tell your friends. Kevin, you were listening to that interview. I felt Eva didn't give quite as much pushback as she might have. Do you think that there's any points she could have argued harder on, or would you have have, uh, pushed anything harder against me? Um, Yes, William. Well, uh, since you're asking for a little bit more heat and a little bit less light, Uh um, one... uh, uh, element of the interview that did make me cringe a little was when you said that you knew children who had insisted they were dinosaurs for a long period of time mm-hmm. and this was a good co- analogy to use when talking about children com- may perhaps communicating about more serious issues like you know, health or like uh, 
tra- transgender issues or, or whatever else. Uh, didn't that kind of firstly have the effect of diminishing a child's voice mm-hmm. and also maybe not put enough emphasis on the role of the parents in these issues? You know, when a child says, I'm a dinosaur, that's not taken terribly seriously. And I think in most cases, if it's a four-year-old, if they're saying, I'm a girl when they're a boy or vice versa, that should be taken equally lightly. And in almost all cases, it is. But I think there could be some cases where you have a very highly ideologically motivated parent where it could be wrongly taken seriously and the fact that you do have four and five year olds and younger uh, being reported as having been referred to the Tavistock Clinic this uh, child gender reassignment or gender identity clinic in Britain that is now closed I, I just don't see how a three or a four year old could even have that concept of being trans let alone express it adequately yeah, but I think there's an important distinction between, you know, you know, letting children make all the decisions and not listening to them at all. I think that children can communicate important messages and, you know, it's not always difficult to distinguish, you know, an important message from play. Mm-hmm. Um, but I just wanted to come on to another thing, which was that... Um, I have a clip that I would like to play for you. This is from uh, Liveline from the mm-hmm. 9th of June. I Well, I it includes me or it does include many women that I speak to. I know if they're trying to include others who may be feeling excluded from it, oh. I think it should suffice to say women and. But I really don't believe that women should be taken, should be taken out of legislation. It's kind of denying our existence. Okay, so um, the use of the phrase uh, denying our existence, I think this is um, ignoring the fact that you can't easily ignore the existence of women. Mm -hmm. However, trans people can easily be um, hand-waved away as people who are either all confused or deceitful and all the implications of that you can easily say that there's no such thing as a genuine trans person if you are so minded Mm -hmm. my question then is isn't it true that people who are you know opposed to you know nominally you know trans rights positions Mm -hmm. also engage in the uh, language games that make for kind of a bad politics uh, yeah I, I'd agree I, I think they're well at the very least they are mischievously reusing this language of you know defining us out of existence and so forth and I think that's what was going on there but I don't I, I think there are nuances to that to that language issue so first of all yeah you're right uh, it's not the same thing that trans people can be, you know, there are people who are opposed to that, particularly on the far right, who are essentially saying, or the meaning of their language is that trans people don't exist. And it's obviously not as credible, it's just not possible to say that women don't exist in the same way. And eliminating the word woman from legislation or whatever, which was the trigger for that live line program, that's obviously not a danger that applies to a class of people such as women in the way that it would apply to a class of people such as trans people. Yeah, I would agree that, that you know, phrasing it in that way is probably unhelpful. But I think there are language issues here. And one of them is around womanhood and so forth. And let's remember, in our constitution, it's still written in a pretty sexist way. So it talks about the president exclusively as he. Nobody has ever had a problem with uh, Mary McAleese or Mary Robinson being president or ever challenged the fact that the constitution referring to them as he governed their actions and their powers and so forth. But I just want to read uh, one thing from an article from uh, a journal called Frontiers in Global Women's Health. This is a bit of an article uh, published by Gribble et al. And it's talking about the insistence of using non-sex specific terms 
And the problems with that, particularly when it comes to women's health, and I'll just quote this piece here. It says, describing the frequency of sex-specific conditions referring to people rather than women as the denominator means that incidents may be misreported. For example, it has been incorrectly stated that one in eight people develop breast cancer, that one in 10 people will get pregnant after having unprotected sex, and that one in 10 people have endometriosis. On the other hand, correctly stating that one in 20 people have endometriosis reduces the cognitive impact of the statistic because of the higher denominator and obfuscates the key feature of that condition that sufferers are almost exclusively female. And then they talk about uh, chest feeding, which for some reason that I absolutely don't understand, seems to be considered to be more trans-inclusive than talking about breastfeeding. I, I really don't understand that. It says, some understand chest feeding to restrictively describe the situation where someone who has little or no breast milk feeds a baby with infant formula through a tube taped to their nipple. Others use it simply as another for, term for breastfeeding. In the midst of this confusion, the health consequences of not breastfeeding may d be diminished if tube feeding infant formula is categorized as breastfeeding slash chest feeding. And it says the word breast is a sex neutral term, which refers to the mammary glands of people, males or females, if you want to put it like that. Referring to chests rather than breasts is medically inaccurate. The chest is the medical terminology referring to the rib cage and everything inside it not including the mammary tissue. Chest pain may signify serious heart or lung conditions. Breast pain might signify a breast condition such as mastitis. So you can see there that you can get tied up in incredible knots trying to force gender neutrality into an area that it just won't go. That article has a whole range of other issues uh, with that where they give examples of inaccurate information being being uh, given in an effort to make the language gender neutral and that is only exacerbated if you're of course as is often the case you're dealing with people who where English is not their first language and I think that there's a fundamentalism there that is very unhelpful that essentially prevents people from taking seriously, taking trans people seriously. And I think, and this is not my analogy, but the analogy has been made before that trans women can be accepted as women in the same way as adoptive children can be ad accepted as the children of their adoptive parents. And nobody jumps up and down and objects if a teacher in a classroom says, make, you know, whatever request referring to the children's mother and father Nobody says that, oh, you have to spe specifically refer to adoptive parents separately, or nobody says that, you know, nobody thinks that that wouldn't include the parents of a child who was adopted. But then if they go into the biology class, and in the biology textbook, it says, typically, you get 50% of your genes from your mother and 50% from your father, then nobody jumps up and down and says, oh, no, that's wrong. Some children don't get any of their genes from their mother or father. People can understand that meaning in context, and I don't see why that can't be done here. Apart from one reason, this battle over language is a submerged battle over the, the, the wider issue. What do you think? Yeah, I, um, I was just... I'm just struck by the fact that, you know, the there are many people who code up signs that say, you know, female, you know, woman equals adult human female. And mm -hmm. we have a documentarian who's just on Joe Rogan on Monday, um, having a documentary saying, what is a woman? You know, there are lots of people who are very invested in these language games. And, um, I was just wondering if it was unfair to maybe single one side out as being particularly interested in it. Um, I think the dominant or the historic language obviously hasn't accommodated trans people. Yeah, I think there's there's um, there's game playing on both sides. There, I think the the Matt Walsh one. I mean, I think that's really you know 
it's not contributing to any any helpful discussion. He has perhaps spotted an inconsistency in the way that uh, trans advocates use language and he is exploiting it. it. It's really turning one maybe slightly clever trick into a whole film. I, I, I'm not very impressed by that. But he's given the opportunity to do that by people who are perhaps being too fundamentalist. Uh, yeah, so one other thing I wanted to touch on was that we mentioned some of the battles over self-ID, for example, in, in prisons in the United Kingdom and whether it's a, an appropriate uh, test uh, in that context. Um, a lot of problems are predicted, but perhaps most people listening to the podcast don't know is might not know that we have had self-ID rules that are similar in Ireland for seven years mm-hmm. and I don't think anyone's noticed has this issue been catastrophized yeah I, I think it has actually yeah so you get the, all these uh, I mean we get a lot of British spillover media and you know frankly you do get uh, people who are very much opposed to the trans uh, activists Essentially, yeah, catastrophizing and saying that everything will fall apart if you have self-ID. There's been self-ID in Ireland. Self-ID basically means if you want to say you're trans, you can say you're trans, fill in a form and get a get a, a, a gender recognition certificate. Exactly what the legal effect of that in every case is, I'm not sure. But clearly, it has, the situation has existed in Ireland for seven years and the sky hasn't fallen. I think that... The test of how that works basically comes down to uh, common sense. And I, I guess, I don't know many of them, but I guess most trans people are fairly normal people who want to get on with their lives and, and that's not going to intrude on the rights of anybody. But there's a couple of cohorts that I think are much more problematic and I think fine self ID, but you need to have some level of common sense. And the two particular cohorts that I think are problematic on this are number one, young teenage girls. And people will have heard of the Tavistock Clinic. This is the clinic that has been closed down following a very negative report about its the safety for its patients. And it was particularly catering to young people, children under 18, who have gender identity issues or who are potentially trans. In the space of five years, the number of people, the number of children being referred to that clinic just exploded. It went from under 80 per year to over 2,700 per year. So that just absolutely exploded. I mentioned that uh, during the interview with Aoife, but the real issue is that the numbers were not spread out evenly and the great bulk of that incredible increase is among girls who previously were a minority of patients being referred. Now the great majority and the overwhelming growth is among girls aged 13, 14, 15. And to me, that's very worrying because that cohort is particularly vulnerable to what's called mass sociogenic illnesses. A few of these have arose, but you can see things, for example, like we had in the 1980s, there was a craze about jogging and keep fit and Jane Fonda workout videos and so forth. And that expressed itself pretty quickly in the late 80s, early 90s, in a huge spike in the cases of anorexia and bulimia. And now when we have a huge amount of discussion in the media and in society about trans issues, we see that exact same cohort of young teenage girls presenting in enormously disproportionate numbers as supposedly trans and wanting to transition to be male. The fact that the, that that's a cohort that's hugely overrepresented, and also if you look at the CAST report, that cohort of young girls contains a hugely disproportionate number of girls who have other mental health problems, who have autism, and who are lesbians. And I would be very worried that 
you are getting a cohort of people who are being pushed down one path who perhaps don't fit on that or perhaps a large chunk of them don't, particularly since in the CAS report it was mentioned that the level of psychiatric support was almost zero. Very often people being referred would get one or two one-hour sessions with a psychologist or a psychiatrist before being referred to just go on uh, hormone blockers, cross-sex hormones and on to surgery. I would have thought that it would have been appropriate to have an awful lot more talking therapies to explore exactly what was going on in those young girls' lives. So we're talking about 13, 14, 15 year olds here. Uh, you know, even without mental health difficulties, even without the difficulties posed by being a lesbian or whatever, pretty much all teenagers have, have uh, difficulties with being comfortable in their own bodies. And even more worrying, one thing that was highlighted in the CAST report was that no record at all was kept about the clinical outcomes, about whether that turned out to be successful or not. It would appear that the people in the Tavistock Clinic were tactically not keeping any record of what happened. The other cohort that I think presents a real difficulty is uh, prisoners. And this I was looking at this in the UK. This is very difficult to find in Ireland. But I've been talking to uh, Her Majesty's Inspector of Prisons, to the ONS and to the Department of Justice in the UK. And the figures are kind of hard to get because they don't collect exactly all the information and there is some blurring. But the the best fit for the information we have is that amongst sex offenders, let's say male sex offenders or male-bodied sex offenders in UK prisons presenting, uh, they are presenting as trans women at a rate that's something between 100 and 120 times higher than the general population. And you know, if it was three times higher or five times higher, you might wonder what's going on but think that it's plausible. But if it's 100 or 120 times higher, I'd have to be very, very cautious about that. And I think that, so first of all, sex offenders, particularly sex offenders in prison, are particularly disinhibited people in the first place. And they are, I think, likely to be people who are going to game the system to their advantage. And you'd have to be suspicious that at least a large proportion of these are trying to game the system to get out of the male prison system and into what they might perceive to be a much softer regime in a women's prison, or just straight up attention seeking, or seeking to get into a women's prison to have access to women to abuse, or are just entertaining themselves and getting over the boredom of being in prison, or some mixture of any or all of those. And I think if you've got self-ID, yeah, fine, okay. But I think where you have specific risks and specific instances where common sense might be needed to override that, then I think nobody could legitimately complain that common sense should override that. So, for example, in the case of the of the uh, the the prisoners, you know, the first duty of the prison authorities is to keep prisoners safe. And, you know, prisoners who present as trans could well be at enormously elevated risk. They need to protect them, equally women in women's prisons. And I think just giving them the, the, um, uh, the discretion to deal with that in the most appropriate way is probably the best thing to do. I might add that um, if one of the push factors is that conditions in a male prison are much worse than prison, conditions in a woman's prison, I think we'd all like to see, like to have a situation where conditions are the same for all prisoners, at least in accordance with their offence. Mm-hmm. OK, I think I'll leave it there, William. Thank you. Do you agree? Do you disagree? Here's How is Ireland's political, social and current affairs podcast. Go to the website for sources and references from the show. And while you're there, you can like the show on Facebook, follow the show on Twitter at Here's How Podcast and follow Aoife Gallagher at Aoife G-A-L-L. And get in touch with me if you can suggest a guest or a topic for the next show. And thanks to all of our patrons on Patreon. 
I keep saying we don't get anything like some other Irish podcasters get, and I got some feedback, some people saying that that sounds like I'm complaining. Absolutely not. We are delighted with all of our patrons, and if you want to join them and support the show, you can do that at patreon.com slash here's how. We use that money to finance things like web hosting and other small expenses, but Kevin and myself basically do the podcast for free. The link is on the website. Also there you can find out how to subscribe to the podcast for free on your computer, on your phone, or by email. All of that is at www.hereshow.ie. The Here's How podcast is produced and presented by me, William Campbell. The assistant producer is Kevin Wolf. Thank you for listening. Thank you.